What is up, down and sideways, all you absolutely stunning individuals? It's another repi of the Gun Talk Eric and Mark here with you guys, and we are now what we're calling week six, getting into the global power rankings. And I'm gonna tell you right now, Mark, this is the biggest change that we've had in the top 20 in any of the lists we've done in summer, maybe even in spring, because there is flip flopping pretty much from top to bottom this week. I'm calling this one the ramen episode because this is like when you're making some ramen, you've already added all the soup ingredients, all the soup base, you've added the noodles. Now it's time for the extras. Are you adding the egg? Are you adding some cheese? Are you adding anything extra to this one? That's how I feel about this global power rankings right now. It has been, we've been brewing, we've been boiling, we've had the noodles in the soup. Now it's time to add the extras, and that is where we get some of the big changes, movers, and shakers in this global power rankings. And we start with that very first board where we got a couple of squads coming into their own for the very first time or getting onto this list for the first time. This split starting at 20. FPX, Fun Plus Phoenix, finally seeing some life with Milky Way and the boys. Three series wins in a row, obviously highlighted by a shocking 201 against LNG, who we'll obviously get to later, who are flying through, but somehow FPX was ready for that challenge. And we have been waiting for the FPX resurgence to come through in the LPL. We knew that the, one of the things that was going to come through from the way that the split was split out with the fearless draft at the beginning and then this next part of the, uh, the round robin coming on through, being in this territory with the proven winners, the better teams from that first part of it, we knew that the challenge was going to be there to say, can you cut it against the better half of the LPL? Can you prove that you can still generate that momentum? And there were some questions at the beginning parts of it, but you have laid it out, listing out, getting those three wins and getting a big one against a surging LNG. That's enough to throw FPX into the very beginning of this global power rankings. Other debut roll up coming in at 18. Carmine Corp quietly, actually not quietly, very loudly making it into a top four finish. We called heading into playoffs. SK 8 and 1. Let's see you show up in playoffs. Well, they had twice as many wins in the regular season as Carmine Corp, and they were outmatched in this best of three mark. I, I think it was kind of a, you know, one of those times like being at a racetrack where you're, you see the car and then you don't see the car for the next couple of minutes. Everything just glimpse, you, you miss it type of situation. I felt like all the good that we saw from SK kind of in this last week or so is that glimpse and you miss it type of thing. And on the other hand, Carmine Corp has been steadily building up and I think it is, uh, you know, due to give them the respect for what they have done this split, especially considering how far they've had to come throughout this year and the changes that have had to go through to get this type of power and make this type of change happen on the rip. But you got to give them that credit for that. And one of the big things about it is upset, playing more so like the name that he has built for himself in the European region. Big part of that is looking at the meta, the champions that are involved down in that bottom lane, the type of options that he has available to him. I think that is a major strong point for Carmine Corp. And how about we were ready to call Closer's career done? The dude is washed, and it turns out he still got a whole lot left in the tank on both tanks and some AP carries. Combine that with getting a blessed Korean Jace over in EU with Kana, and the top side of K Corp looks fantastic across this series. I think Closer, Closer's had some experience working with Korean top laners before, Mr. Someday. He's had no problem getting on page with them in that situation. I think this one, for me, yes, you had some concerns. Yes, you had some questions about it. But this was what I envisioned when you added Closer to the roster, what you thought was going to be possible for him, when you knew what type of potential he carried and how that could apply into the LEC and where that could change the fortunes for Carmine Corp. This is the thumbs up. We're looking good. It's looking good. Obviously, still, they haven't clinched a season final spot. They got to get that next win against uh, BDS, who you can see a few spots ahead of them on this list. Just doing enough. They had this absolutely, unbelievably egregious 2v5. A pair of AD carries against Giant X, uh, the Tristana, and the Zeri. Listen... Ice and Nuke played it out about as cleanly as you could, but it's just the state of the game when you're seeing two full health AD carries against five Giant X members and everyone's kind of going, I like those odds. 
are we getting used to seeing this one before we start ramping up the gauntlets and the world runs and everything else for the double adc meta the rolling through whatever type of physical option ad you can in the mid lane and then whatever's left over is going to be the bot lane type of situation you never know you never know with this one and really it's a situation when we talk about what has come through and i feel like this type of shakeup at the very least is is something we've been looking for in the meta and i mean yeah credit to bds they showed up a little bit more uh, than sk might honestly favor k corp in that matchup we'll see obviously you get adam versus upset which is the fun little side storyline there uh sandwich between some of them is weibo who climb up a bit because they took a game off of BLG, even though they got smashed in game three. They had some bite and fight back against the top dog in the LPL. I swear, this is like going to a restaurant and eating a dish and thinking, man, this thing is amazing. I love this thing. I've got to come back here next week. And you go back next week and you get food poisoning. And you're like, ah, you know what? It's a one-off. That's I the Weibo go experience. And you go back and you get food poisoning. And then someone, you know, down the line says, let me bring you back to this restaurant. And you go back and it's amazing again. And you're like, ah, that, that food poisoning was nothing. And you get food poisoning again. But we're on the point where you're getting served an amazing appetizer. And that is Weibo the last week or so, what they've been able to do. I think one of the big ones that we have been looking at and we have been heavily criticizing what's been going on is Tarzan, making sure that you can get some type of positive performances, some type of big performances from him. That is a big part of what is going to drive the engine for the team. A few spots ahead of uh, the, you know, sometimes toxic Weibo gaming is FlyQuest. It was Immortals. It was 2-0. Business as usual, really, just like the other LCS squads with the huge gap between top three and bottom five. We need these top three to be playing each other to really test out where they stand in terms of North America and the LCS as a bigger picture. A couple of squads dropping down back below the top 10 are both Anyone's Legend and G2 Esports. Obviously, Anyone's Legend, uh, Weibo, one of those head-to-heads they were losing. The hype from the early 3-0 start died down a little bit because they lost two in a row. I'm not ready to to throw them into fraud watch type of situation or territory. I think that we have seen enough from uh, this Anyone's Legend team to to shed that type of territory. Although, when you do look at a squad like Weibo Gaming, who we've had the fraud label on them and off them and on them and off them type of situation, you never really know in the LPL. Uh, for right now, Anyone's Legend are taking that consequences, are taking that hit from the losses in the series. And the other one, right beside them, I think is G2. G2 Esports and what we have seen from them in the, in the type of coordination and play and specifically coming through that Fnatic series, that best of that goes all the way. And for me, the most disappointing part of that was Broken Blade in the top side. I think his individual performance and the way that they tried to manufacture some type of difference, some type of change in the champion pool and everything else, not quite having the performance and the handle on that type of Varus, that type of option that I think you would want to be seeing from a top tier option of the LEC like G2 should be. And listen, despite the loss for G2, it still feels right to have these two EU squads neck and neck because that series was neck and neck, especially game three and game five. One or two team fights going slightly differently, a player making one or two more different decision making uh, calls throughout, and the series is going a different way. So, incredibly close series. No reason to think. I feel like if G2 gets back to the finals, they're still going to be favorites against Fnatic, even though they just lost. It's crazy, and I think maybe there'd be one little bit more of an angle in the in the favor of Fnatic, where you could talk about what Razwerk did in the series, how Humanoid played in the series, and the big moments that they had. But you do look at the side of G2, and you realize, well, bad performance from BB, and a bad, you know, even on that time, he still had his moments again against Oscar. So Oscar wasn't providing anything really as a stiff test on the other side. And then you look at the jungle and you're talking about Yike and you're going down to support and looking at what Mickey was doing. And both of those players were impact players and players who had their hand on the pulse of this series. And that is a concern for me if you're a fanatic because you get them the opportunity to change things. You get a bit more support from BB in that top side. This series is drastically different. I'm ready to sound the alarm bell as we roll into the top 10 because I'm pretty sure this is the first time ever doing these global power rankings that we have two, count them two, Mark, LCS teams in the top 10. And I know that's combined with G2 Fnatic, 
butting heads, kind of pulling each other together. Cloud9, though, another dominant 2-0 against the 100 Thieves. I think it was JoJo said it felt like it was a scrim, and they've been incredibly dominant for four straight series in a row. Um, you know, what What do you want to do when you look at all the numbers if you want to go, you know, strict into stats type of thing? And all of them are better this split for Cloud9 than they were last split. And yes, last split had a lot of the struggles, a lot of the inconsistencies, but you still knew at their very best, this was arguably the top team of the LCS and what they were capable of. So to see those numbers improve, to see that drastically almost every single important category, they're number one, number two, and that worst number three in the LCS, this is a top tier squad. And the only comparison right now is that Team Liquid hanging around them. But it, you're right, we need that situation where you are seeing that head to head to start separating, start really feeling out where this picture is of the LCS. We're not gonna get that until the last last week or two, the schedule makers knowing that we were waiting for the Cloud9 test at that point. Yeah, it's, it's insane. The last two matches for Cloud9 are Team Liquid and FlyQuest. So good chance they're running into those matchups five and zero. But uh, yeah, you mentioned Team Liquid. Okay, it was a little bit sloppy against Dignitas at times this week, but not enough to knock them out of that eight spot that they've been comfortable in for the last couple of weeks. People were even saying, is this the best LCS team ever for Team Liquid? Where I'm like, pump the brakes, guys. It's It's been like a split that they've been playing at this level. I'm certainly not ready to throw best ever uh, for the LCS. Not that, again, it's going to be an incredibly stiff competition, but there is some competition. That has to be acknowledged in, in, in the teams in the history that we have here and some of these runs that they've been able to put through. This Team Liquid run is up there. It should be up in contention. It should be talked about uh, sometime soon in that type of conversation. Biggest things for me with this Team Liquid uh, surge and domination of the LCS is it's done by APA and Jan in the bottom lane, looking at the mid and the, and the bottom for this Team Liquid team and what they've been able to do, how they've been able to improve and how they've been able to take leadership positions and roles for this Team Liquid team is a massive development. One that I think the individuals deserve that credit for the, you know, the organization, the coaching staff spawn and what he has been able to develop that environment there that deserves credit for this type of situation. But to see APA and Yon be these two main big threats and be supported by the stability you get from Impact in the top side, by General Umpty, by Core JJ, this is a Team Liquid team that you have got to be feeling good about. Sandwiched in between those two LCS teams. A little known squad, uh, you know, nucleate on the block, drop in five spots out of the top five, T1. Now sporting a 5-5 five and five record, and Mark, it's not just that they lost two straight series to Hanwha Life. It's not that they're dropping a game to Fox. It's the fashion that they're losing these games, and their most recent two series on the Rift, they honestly looked more lost than they have in, like, 18 months. It's a problem because we've talked about this situation and the schedule and what was possibly going to happen and what we are possibly seeing as far as this burnout, you know, a tired, you know, empty of the tank type of situation, it's very much so looking at the rest of the LCK and specifically the competitors that they're in that tier with, Hanwha Life, D plus Kia, Gen G, you're seeing them both throttle. They're driving, they got a full tank of gas. T1 is out here at the gas station, uh, slamming on the door saying, is there anybody to come help me with this pump and make sure that it's working so I can get back on the road and moving again. The you know, last time that T1 slip was in any type of territory like this was when Faker was missing time due to the hand, due to the wrist injury, subbing in Poby and the disruption that that caused for the team. That was the last time we saw any type of slide, any type of negative performance in any type of way similar to this one for T1. This is obviously different with the entirety of the roster there, but it is that schedule. It is that run down T1. I think no matter what, no matter how much you want to diminish it, it has to be acknowledged that this is the factor that is dragging T1 down. And there's no magic fix of Faker coming back into the lineup that's going to get them back on course, which makes it harder to see them coming out of this slump. But we have seen them turn it on in playoffs before. It feels like they're just really going to 
run through the motions to close out this regular season and hope for like a fifth seed as we run into playoffs. But the opposite end of that spectrum right now, climbing, soaring, ascending six spots up is LNG, who not only have they shedded the skin of the fraud label, they've got a big shiny hat that says contender because they've now beaten top esports BLG and JDG, and you might say, well, how are they not higher than all of these squads? Well, we still have a full split that we're talking about looking at a body of work for LNG, but seven spots soaring up is more than admirable for what they've done. You know, the Dark Knight Rises when Batman has to climb his way all out of the cave. That's essentially the type of hole that LNG put themselves in with their performance. And it has been miraculous because it's the leap to grab the next rock, the next rope to pull yourself even higher that you missed before. That's what the LNG's pulling off, but they still got the climb. It is still ahead of them. They've still got to be moving up. This is a very exciting one to talk about the way that they have completely changed the fortunes, the way things have turned around, and specifically, scout in the mid lane playing at that elite level being a game changing player the one that is a factor no matter what's going to happen in this game scout is involved for lng and if he's involved gala's popping off getting his comfort picks it's an easy ticket towards the top for lng and gala a breath of fresh air to be having Ziggs as a pocket pick in this 80 carry centric meta. But yeah, Scout was absolutely on it in this series against JDG. Predicting Yagao's flashes on the Yone, he completely outmatched him in this game three especially. Yeah, and I think this is one of those ones where we had been tracking JDG and we'd been feeling a lot more positive about what they had been able to do and knowing still, you know, tough sledding, tough schedule at the very top of the LPL. But you had hoped that this was one that they could still keep track of they could still get that edge lng yes you're surging up but we can still hold that line we can still be the denier and say we are that tier above in the lpl you can't say that you can't say that anymore even with the improvements that we have seen from this jdg team lng has got to be the store in the lpl right now Sliding into that top five, which again has some of the biggest shakeups that we've had this entire summer split, starting with a couple of guys either returning or debuting. Uh, top esports after that rough 0 2 start, even though they were competitive against BLG. Kind of the opposite of LNG, where what happened in the first round, what happened at EWC gave them a lot of leeway. Now they've rallied off three straight series wins and done it all in 2 0 fashion, all in dominant fashion at that yes they, they got the message is the safe thing to say about top esports they knew this surge from the lck d plus kia hanwha life finding their way into this top five into the vip they knew they said man we've been we've been here all this time and t1's not showing up this week crazy there's gonna be new people in here we gotta make sure we're holding on to our spot in this vip and that's absolutely those three series that you've laid out the way that they were winning them the time that it took for them to win them, the speed that they're going through those games. Absolutely, this is more so like the way that we start, that we wanted to talk about top esports throughout this split. And how about D plus, the sheer act of taking a game, not even a series, a game off of Gen G is enough for you to be like, okay, let's take D plus real seriously now. Well, let's be real. It's also that it wasn't just about taking a single game. It was about that, the fact that it should have been a series win for D plus Kia. They had it in their hands. They had the road. They saw it. They had the opportunity and everything. And it was just snatched away from them by Gen G. It wasn't fumbled. It wasn't bobbled. None of that stuff from D plus Kia. It was a Gen G difference that comes through and was able to snatch that one away from them in that situation. But you do got to give the credit over to Showmaker and the crew, what they were able to do in that first game. I think they've seen a level up from Kingen as well in the top side and a lot more so like the DRX World's MVP Kingen that we are seeing. And we know if any time he shows up at that type of level, the rest of the parts are there for D plus Kia to be an elite level team in the LCK. We have seen it. We know the bottom lane. Yes, there's some inconsistency, some question marks still with aiming from time to time. But when he's on, He's on enough to be at that top tier ultimate level. And then Lucid has been phenomenal throughout the jungle as a rookie. I think that one can't be understated enough how well and how seamlessly he has transitioned onto this team for a team and a player, an icon that he was replacing in Canyon, who has continued to deliver that top tier, top of the LCK level performance for Genji. 
it's just it's so bizarre to see T1 in such a yucky slump. But you're feeling fantastic about the LCK because of D plus Hanwha even separated itself further, and of course uh, Gen G speed running the entire league. And even a more wild thing about that is it's all about the merits, individual merits of those teams and what they're doing, how good they look. It's not because you're going, yeah, well, T1's really stinking it up. There's this gap, there's this opening for these teams to jump in. That's why it's happening. It simply is, those teams are impressive. They are exciting. That is why you're moving them up in this situation and you're left, you're left with the unsightly eyesore that is T1's games recently and why you're all of a sudden sweating four world spots for the LCK, but with the top three looking like that, it's it's no walk in the park whenever a gauntlet rolls around or even this playoff push for T1 and any of the other teams in the LCK. And T1's form, you know, if this continues, this struggle, this period, whatever, how long it's gonna last, whether they can rebound, all those type of things, it started with a loss to KT Rolster. And if you're looking at that playoff picture, that world's type of picture, who you could possibly be fighting for that last spot, you're looking at a KT roster. Maybe, maybe Kwangdong Freaks type of situations. I know they've certainly cooled off in the last little bit, but that is that territory where you're gonna have that competition. And in your weakened state, your your disrupted state, we have seen you be vulnerable to those type of teams. So it absolutely is not without the question that T1 could possibly be a victim. Real quick, last squad on this uh, list we haven't talked about. BLG still firmly in that number two spot at four and one. And again, it looks like it's Mr. Way's job to lose going forward in the jungle. Oh, man, it's the reinforcement. It's the substitution coming on through. It is the additional power up that is bought through for BLG Way coming on through and coming into the jungle and having a difference making appearance in those two games that he's able to play changes things up for BLG, secures them a path to victory. That's the difference that comes through from Wei. And instantly, I don't know if we're going to see Jun again. That's the type of problem that Wei instantly solves the plug for BLG. Yeah, it's crazy how quickly the synergy has worked uh, with Wei and the rest of the BLG boys. So sitting very pretty in that number two spot. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, a wonderful people. As always, thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.